Ooh, boy, nice and loud. Awesome. All right, yeah, so we'll talk about advanced authentication and encrypted connections uh, inside of Postgres. Uh, I'm Stephen Frost. I'm CTO at Crunchy. I've done stuff uh, in Postgres. Uh, but let's not dwell on that. Let's kind of dive right into it. So Postgres has a number of different authentication methods that are available. And I'm going to kind of go through and talk through ones that I feel are really the recommended ones, right? This is kind of the advanced authentication side of things. Uh, and then we'll talk through ways of configuring uh, Postgres with these different options and ways of controlling uh, things on both the client and the server side. Uh, because when you're thinking about authentication and you're thinking about encryption, uh, these things are important to consider uh, from both the client and the server side. A lot of people look at things as like, well, we care about the server being super secure. Well, you want to make sure that the client is secure too, because otherwise you end up with problems like man in the middle attacks and things like that. So in terms of authentication methods that I would recommend, uh, the big ones are GSS, um, also known as GSS API, also known as Kerberos, or SSPI, uh, which is essentially the same thing, but using the Windows uh, environment. Um, so GSS uh, integrates with MIT and Heimdall uh, Kerberos. It also integrates with Active Directory. Uh, so this is what I strongly recommend for really like any kind of proper enterprise deployments, right? Where you have an Active Directory environment, you really should be using GSS or SSPI. Um, that's what uh, Windows uses for all of its authentication. Um, and that's what is really strongly recommended. Another really strong approach is to use certificate-based authentication. So this is TLS slash SSL, where we have client-side certificates and we also have server-side certificates and these are used to cross-validate each other. We'll talk a lot more about certificates later. Um, you can also do uh, what's called mapping and I'm gonna talk a bit more about that, but you can map what are called CNs, which is your common name inside of a client-side certificate to Postgres usernames to keep things a little bit more sane. Last but certainly not least is Scram. This is the salted challenge response authentication method. This is the password-based method that you should be using these days. Uh, if you're using any other password-based method, uh, you really need to move off of it. And I'm gonna talk through some of the other ones here in a moment. Last, uh, and then finally, Peer. This is only over local Unix sockets. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but um, it's, basically passes through what Unix user connected. So if you're not using these authentication methods, then you're doing things that I would argue are not secure. Um, and I'm gonna talk through why, right? Uh, so the ones that I would say are not ideal uh, are methods that send clear text passwords to the Postgres server, right? So big one on this list is PAM. PAM has got all kinds of other issues because the PAM modules run as the Postgres user, not as root, so that's problematic. But one of the biggest issues with PAM is that it sends the user's password over the wire, right, which is terrible. Uh, you can use things like SASLAuthD um, to be able to run some of those methods, uh, some of those authentication um, routines that you can get with PAM. Um, Obviously, if you're using PAM, you're gonna have to be using TLS or SSL in order to be able to provide some kind of encryption on the wire. But still, it's a bad idea to send clear text passwords. It's also a bad idea to save clear text passwords uh, on any system. Uh, Radius is another method. It's a little bit better because typically it's used with a one-time password system, but it still is sending that information over the clear uh, to the server, which is not great. So you wanna be using SSL here too. Password is your traditional password-based authentication method. Uh, again, sending passwords over the wire is bad. Even, in, even through encrypted connections, it is bad to be doing that. Uh, is, it is not a, <laughs> a good thing to do. Now, these are methods that I would strongly, strongly say you should be avoiding. Uh, MD5 is the biggest one, right? It's old, it's deprecated. MD5 is known to have a lot of issues in terms of um, how good a hashing algorithm it is, and you really should just move to Scram, right? There, there's not a lot of reason not to, um, and it is, uh, you know, Scram is now widely supported in all the different client libraries, and that is really what you should be moving to. Um, MD5 also suffers from something called pass the hash, uh, which is an issue, and so that's another reason to, uh, to avoid it. Um, and what that basically means is that you don't actually need the password, all you need is the hash in order to be able to use, uh, in order to be able to authenticate uh, against the Postgres server. 
LDAP. Lots of people use LDAP. I don't like it. Um, it uses a simple bind connect to the LDAP server. The way that it does this is that the user's password when they are authenticating is sent to the Postgres server. And the Postgres server then turns around and uses that to, uh, in proxies those credentials, to authenticate to the LDAP server. And you should just be using GSS API instead, or SSPI, depending on if you're on a Windows environment. Um, almost always this is because somebody's got it in their head that LDAP is the way you authenticate with Active Directory. Yes, it's possible to do that. No, it's not how you do it. It's not how Windows does it. It's not how any of the Windows services do it. It's not how any of the more secure environments do it because passing that password across the wire, even through an encrypted connection, is insecure, right? The Postgres server has no need to ever see the user's password. That doesn't happen with Scram, it doesn't happen with GSS API, it doesn't happen with SSPI, and there's good reason for that. Uh, IDENT is, is ancient and old, nobody should be using it these days. And don't use trust, right? A lot of people, you know, you, you look at trust and you're like, oh, trust is secure. No, no, trust basically is a, is a developer hack inside of Postgres. It, it should be pound defined from, you know, and not even compiled into the binary if you ask me. Um, because it just basically bypasses all authentication. Just forget it. Um, so just a really quick kind of review of, of PGHBA. I'm not going to harp on this too much because this is a, kind of an advanced, uh, advanced class. But your basic PGHBA authentication or, or configuration allows you to control authentication based on these different options. We read it from the top to bottom, the first match uses. You know, host SSL is if SSL is being used. There's some special database names, special usernames, and the addresses that you can specify here. You can use a, a CIDR mask with. With um, advanced authentication does include some PGHBA stuff. I, I think not enough people use the reject method, right? Reject is actually really useful because you can carve out whole swaths of address space. And like, if I ever see a connection from any address in any space like this. I'm just going to reject it outright, right? Um, things like that are, are good to do so that you minimize the risk that uh, something ends up getting through a little bit farther than you intended. Uh, PG ident is next. Um, this is for mapping uh, system users to Postgres users, right? So here you can specify some regular expressions. Uh, or you can just map, you know, bare names. You can say the Unix user Joe can log in as the Postgres user Bob if you want. Um, client side certificates. So this is uh, your, you know, this would be your CN common name. You can control what that ends up being in the Postgres side of things. And then Kerberos principles are really cool because you can use these regular expressions to say, I want to allow a capture here with this dot star in the regular expression, and then that is replaced with the backslash one to allow you to then uh, authenticate as as whatever user at that particular realm, um, you know into the Postgres system. Uh, you specify what map to use inside of your PGHBA using a map equals and then specify whatever the map name is that you want for that particular PGHBA line. So that's you know a lot about the server kind of side of things. I'm gonna talk through a bunch of the client side stuff now. So there's a bunch of client side options that I think people don't consider uh, and don't think about. Uh, and they're really important because a lot of the options that we initially have set are meant for more compatibility, not for security. So first option when we're talking about this from libpq is channel binding. So channel binding prevents man in the middle attacks. The way that it does this is that it binds the TLS encryption layer into the scram exchange. This is only really sensible when we're talking about TLS and scram. Uh, if you're talking about client-side certificates, if you're talking about GSS API encrypted connections, those things are already handling this for you. Uh, but when you have TLS and Scram, you want to be able to prove both directions. You want the server to be able to prove that it's the real server and that you're actually talking to that server, and you want the client to be able to prove that it's actually the correct client that's being um, authenticated. Uh, and you get that with channel binding. Um, so the options are require, prefer, and disable, and you really want to set this to require on your client when you're using TLS and Scram. This is a, a really big deal in order to prevent those man-in-the-middle attacks. Now, I have people who ask me this sometimes, and they're like, well, what about 
PG Bouncer? And what about other proxies? And yeah, that's going to going to not work, <laughs> right? It's kind of the point because those are man in the middles, right? Um, so if you're using those, it's a bit more complicated to deal with, but um, sorry, right? This is more about security. Uh, those are, are different options for other, other op you know, other environments maybe you can use those in, but I do recommend using require when you're using TLS and Scram together. A new option in PG-16 that I'm really excited about is the require off libpq option. This allows the client to specify what authentication methods they're okay with, right? Previously, Postgres would just kind of like, well, we're going to ask the server, and the server will tell us whatever they want to tell us. So the server might say, well, I want to use password, clear text password off. Well, sure, <laughs> an attacker is going to do that because then guess what, that, that attacker is then going to get your password, right? Uh, you can specify multiple methods. Uh, these are the list of valid options. Um, this doesn't really apply for client-side certificates or for GSS API encrypted connections. Um, that's what the none is for. Uh, but recommendation, ideally set it to exactly the off method that you are expecting to be using here, right? If you're in a Kerberos environment, you should set require off to GSS or to none if you're using encrypted connections, which obviously you should be if you have the option to. Um, but at least, at least use it to exclude things like password and MD5, right? There's no reason to have those enabled. So, you know, if it was up to me, I would probably have this as the default in Postgres, <laughs> but it's not up to me. Um, so yeah, as mentioned, none doesn't prevent TLS or, or GSS API, but you can use this to prevent clear text passwords from being sent over to the Postgres server, which is a big, big deal and something I strongly recommend everybody do. All right, I'm gonna talk through a few other options here. Uh, so CRLs, certificate revocation lists. When you're using TLS or, or SSL, you're using some kind of certificate authority. That certificate authority should be publishing a CRL, a list of certificates that are no longer valid, no longer trusted. You should be downloading that and using it. Strongly recommend that you set SSL CRL to a maintained and regularly updated CRL. Other options exist like OCSP. Um, there are upsides and downsides to using it. O OCSP is a way of actually the server can reach out and check with a uh, CA to see whether or not the certificate that's being presented has been rejected or not. But at least have a CRL uh, or use uh, the SSL CRL DIR, uh, which is a way of having a directory of CRLs uh, that you can have specified so that uh, OpenSSL can go look up and see if there's anything there, that it, if the certificate should be rejected. The next one is, again, this is client side, SSL mode. SSL mode has a whole bunch of different crazy options, and there's only one that you should use, <laughs> and that is verify full, right? Um, the options for you know allow, prefer, require, verify CA, none of those actually make sure that the certificate presented by the server matches the host that you're trying to connect to. This is a big deal. You want to verify that the host you're connecting to is giving you the certificate that you're expecting. If it's not presenting the certificate you're expecting, things should blow up. <laughs> there should be a big warning saying, hey, no, that's not the right cert. This is a problem. Strongly recommend setting uh, SSL mode to, uh, to verify full. It's kind of an interesting one because it also has require, but require doesn't do what verify full does. So you really want to be using verify full for SSL mode. Um, now in new and 16, there's also an SSL cert mode, uh, which allows the client to choose whether or not to send a client certificate. Um, I, I do recommend setting this to require when you're using client side certificates, but it doesn't really provide any proper additional security because the server can just ignore it. Um, but it's a, it's a new feature in 16, so people might be interested in it. Require peer. Um, this is only valid if you're on like a Unix system and you're connecting uh, using the peer authentication method. But this basically says, I want to actually connect to the Postgres server. 
I don't want to connect to some random socket that some other person has dropped into a directory that maybe they're trying to use to get my information or perform some kind of man-in-the-middle attack over sockets. Um, of course, the recommendation here is set it to Postgres or whatever the OS user that Postgres is running as. A lot of this is addressed through directory permissions. Most distributions will actually put the socket into a secure directory um, that only the Postgres user has write access to. That's fantastic. Still a good thing to do is set require peer when you're using peer authentication. Uh, similar to the SSL mode, there is a GSS ENC mode. Uh, which allows the client to require that GSS API encryption be used. Um, of course, if you're using GSS API, my recommendation is set this to require so that on the client you are actually forcing it to go and use encryption over, you know, with GSS API when connecting to Postgres. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about these authentication methods. In particular, we're going to talk a good bit about Kerberos, and then we're going to talk a good bit about TLS and SSL, because those are the methods that provide encrypted connections to Postgres. So how does Kerberos work? Kerberos works by having what's called a KDC. Um, in Active Directory, this is your domain controller, right? Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. You then have ticket granting tickets, so as soon as you log into a, post, er, into a Windows environment, you get a ticket granting ticket. There are then these things called principles, and you have user principles and service principles. So a user principle would be like me, right? My, my principle is sfrost at snowman.net, as an example, right? Service principle would be the Postgres service, okay? So this would be the Postgres service running on a specific host, in fact. The key tab file contains the service principal information. I'm going to talk more about key tabs in a minute. But just be aware that that's really the anchor between the service and the KDC, right? It's their shared secret, essentially. Uh, and that's what allows them to uh, uh, validate against each other. Now, when you're running Postgres um, on Unix inside of an Active Directory environment, if you want to have it be actually directly integrated with the Active Directory system, that is, you want the Postgres service to be available inside of the realm that AD controls, okay? This is a very typical setup. All the services end up being inside of one big realm, and all the users exist inside of that realm. In order to set this up, you need to have a user account in Active Directory, and the service needs to exist in Active Directory. And then you have to map that user account to that service. This is all kind of Windows Active Directory fun. The Unix system uh, or systems will need a key tab file that has that service principal information in it. Again, that's the trust and the shared secret between the KDC and the, and the service. And then so you'll have to export that key tab file and copy it to the Unix system. So there is actually a pretty simple Windows command to do all of that in one shot, and it's called KT Pass. Um, Kerberos on Unix systems, I say typically means MIT Kerberos or Heimdall here for the libraries. We stopped supporting Heimdall. Uh, the reason is that they don't maintain it properly. Um, they, they, they forked MIT Kerberos at one point, essentially, and started rebuilding all of it, and then they kind of stopped maintaining it once MIT Kerberos could be exported out of the US, and so it, it really, it's not properly maintained. If anybody really, really loves Heimdall and wants to argue with me about it, I'd be happy to talk to you. But uh, as of 16, we no longer support uh, Heimdall. Um, and very few people have really complained about it as far as I'm aware. I haven't heard a lot. Um, almost always it's MIT Kerberos these days on Unix systems. So in order to create that service principle in Windows, you use this KT pass. So you have an out, right? That's like the key tab file I mentioned. You then have the principal name. So principal name is going to be Postgres, right? That's the well-known service name uh, for the Postgres service. Then you have the, the server uh, and its fully qualified domain name, and you have at and then whatever the realm is, right? You then, as mentioned, you need this map user, right? Whatever the user was that you created inside of AD, such as maybe it was PG server, right, or PG1 server. Uh, and then you can uh, specify um, rand pass to choose a random password, which of course is what you should do. And then you want to specify the cryptology or the um, crypto to use for this, which is AES 256. 
Um, and then this now is supported by Windows and MIT Gerberos and, and older versions of Postgres Heimdall. So this is basically you run this, and then you can go and copy that key tab file over to Postgres, and now all of a sudden you have this uh, key tab file and a service inside of Active Directory that you can then authenticate against using uh, GSS API on the server side coming from SSPI on the client side. Uh, or possibly from GSS API on the, on the client side too. Uh, Unix systems can actually request tickets from the uh, Windows KDC as well. Um, so when you're using an MIT KDC, it's a little bit different, it's not hugely different, but you do need a service principle in the MIT KDC. You don't need a separate user uh, principle uh, when you're talking to a, a MIT uh, KDC. Uh, KD admin is the tool to use uh, for creating principles, and basically you can just run this add prink command, right? Specify rand key so that it doesn't prompt you for uh, a key, and that's it, off you go, right? You create the key tab file using a kt add command, right? Uh, inside of k -ad. so the add prank and the kt add are both commands that you run inside of k admin. Um, but then that's it, right? You you create the principle, you add, you know create the uh, key tab file by exporting it using kt add, and then you copy that key tab file over to the Postgres server. So now to install that, you do need to configure your etkrb5.conf. A lot of systems, like especially in like Active Directory environments, enterprise deployments like that, will have everything in DNS already for you, right? It'll have the realm, it'll have what KDCs to talk to, depending on what realm. A lot of that will automatically be managed for you inside of a Windows environment, uh, because just that's just stuff that Active Directory just does for you. But if you need to, you can go and configure at DKRB5. Um, again, you have to copy that key tab file. Uh, it does, the key tab file is a binary file, so be careful when you're copying it around. Uh, and then you can tell Postgres where that key tab file is using the KRB server key file option in your postgresql.conf. You could store it in the PG data directory if you want. It must be readable only by Postgres. Uh, it also can be used by multiple different Postgres instances on that system if you want. Right, so if you've got 15 uh, different clusters of Postgres running on a particular system, you could have all of them use that same key tab file if you want. Uh, in kind of Kerberos Active Directory world, you have typically a, a distinct plus host name. Uh, they don't really contemplate the idea that you could have GSS with the server on a Windows platform, you say SSPI. And I'll talk a little bit more about if you're running Windows uh, and you're running Postgres on Windows, I'll talk a bit more about that in a bit because uh, there's a few things that are a little bit different. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about GSS API encryption. So this was added into Postgres 12. Uh, it's only currently supported for cases where the client and the server are both using uh, GSS API. Uh, it will work with keys provided by an Active Directory environment, um, but it won't work if you're coming from an SSPI system. So if you're coming from Windows going to uh, a Unix system today, that support doesn't exist. There's no reason why it can't work, right? Um, it's just somebody needs to go write that code and I haven't gotten to it yet. Um, if you're interested in having that, definitely come and talk to me, though. Uh, in your PGHBA, you can specify that uh, connections must be using GSS encryption by saying host GSS ENC. So that will only match connections that are coming in over an uh, encrypted GSS connection. Um, you can specify the inverse of that, too, if you have any particular reason to. All right, delegation support. So this is a, a very cool new feature that I like a lot that I added into uh, Postgres 16 and is part of the reason why we dropped support for Heimdall uh, because Heimdall doesn't have the, the 
<laughs> the recent, which is a decade old, uh, <laughs> um, uh, uh, functions for, for doing delegation um, in the way that I was doing it with MIT Kerberos and the way that the RFCs say you're supposed to do it. Currently only works for GSS uh, when it's GSS client and server. Uh, again, it'll work with keys provided by Active Directory though if you want. Um, it only works for GSS API using connections. You can't forward your credentials over a, a scram connection or something. Uh, on the server, you do need to enable it explicitly by setting GSS accept delegation. And on the libpq side, you have to enable it uh, using GSS delegation. Uh, these delegated credentials are then able to be used for Postgres FDW, DBLink, other things, right? There are other things that it that, uh, could be used for, um, not supported by anything else yet today that I'm aware of, um, but it actually would probably just work in some cases. It, it kind of depends. Um, but the whole point here is that I, as a user, authenticate to Postgres using GSS API over an encrypted connection, and now I can tell, um, I, I can delegate my credentials to that Postgres server, and now the Postgres server has my credentials in you know, a time-boxed manner because it's a, a time-limited ticket that that uh, Postgres server is getting from me, and that Postgres server can then turn around, use those credentials to authenticate to other systems on my behalf. Right, so if I log in as sfrost on server A, and I've got a, a foreign data wrapper set up with another Postgres server, uh, server B, passwords never have to be set anywhere. Right? I can log into A, delegate my credentials, those credentials can then be turned around and used to authenticate to uh, the B server when I query that foreign table. It's very, very cool. Without user, so you do still have to, I mean, you need to set up the FDW as usual with the user mapping and, and everything like that, yes. You don't have to specify a password. Yeah. Because the, there isn't going to be a password, right? The credentials that are going to be used are the delegated credentials that have been delegated by the user to the Postgres server. Hmm? You do still have to specify the, the user mappings because we need to know what the, what the user is to, to log into the remote side, yeah. But very, very cool. Okay, um, so in terms of Active Directory, again, this is very similar, right? There's a KDC, ticket granting ticket, user and service principles. Service principles come from the SSPI uh, interface. So a couple options on Windows environments if you're running Postgres on a Windows server. Right? You can use a domain account for Postgres. Right? The way that you do this is that you actually have to go create an explicit account in the domain for Postgres and change all of the ownership and everything over to that. Um, and then you can change the, the service logon credentials to make Postgres run as that account. Uh, and then you have to tell Active Directory that you've done this by using set SPN. Um, again, this is for setting up a Postgres server on top of a Windows environment that you want to have SSPI authentication working with. Uh, which I do recommend, except I don't recommend running Postgres on Windows. Sorry. <laughs> um, if you want to use a network service instead of a domain, you can do that also. Um, it's not as secure due to using a shared account, but it is the default that some of the installers already use. It's a simpler setup um, because it's kind of the default that some of them use and it just works by just telling, you know, you just gotta set the SPN, right? Tell Active Directory this service exists, um, and then it can start using it. All right, so that's gonna cover pretty much SSPI, Active Directory, GSS API, and Kerberos. Now we're gonna get into certificates. So when we're talking about certificate-based authentication, the first thing you've gotta deal with is setting up a certificate authority, right? Um, and this is all gonna be using OpenSSL-based, um, uh, commands to be able to set this up. So every CA starts with a self-signed certificate. Uh, that's the root of the CA. Then you can create some intermediates. Then you can create uh, client and server certificates. Uh, and then you have to install those and configure the system to use them. So setting up a cert authority in OpenSSL is 
a little bit hokey, but it's not terrible. You do need to make sure that you uncomment the key usage in your OpenSSL CNF file. Uh, it'll be under V3CA as the stanza. Uh, and then you have to have it set to CRL sign and key cert sign so that it can be a signing CA. And then you create a key and create a self-signed certificate using these two commands. Uh, that first one is creating uh, the key. The second one is actually creating the uh, self-signed certificate. All right. Next, we're going to create some intermediate CAs. This is very typical in larger environments. When you have uh, a certificate-based um, authentication, you have intermediate certificate authorities so that the root CA is hardly ever used, right? You go put that into some big vault somewhere. Um, so the way you do that is that you have to create a key for it, and then you create a certificate signing request for the root CA to then sign. Um, and then after that, you can create the uh, server intermediate uh, certificate by signing with the CA certificate. So first one generates the key for the server side intermediate. Um, so we're creating two intermediates, right? We're creating an intermediate that's going to sign, that's going to be used for signing Postgres server certificates. We're going to have an intermediate that's going to be used for signing client side certificates, just so people are, are clear on what we're doing here. Um, so after we create the server intermediate key, we then create the request, the, the CSR, and then the uh, certificate, that's a certificate signing request, and then the CSR is then used to uh, create the actual certificate for the server by having the root CA sign that uh, CSR uh, and generate the server certificate. So now I have a root CA, I have a server intermediate CA. Next, I'm going to set up same thing, but on the client, uh, right? So I'm going to create a client intermediate CA, same basic thing, right? Create the key, uh, create a certificate signing request, have that signed by the root CA. Now we're going to go create the actual server certificate, right? And this is going to create a key, create a CSR, and then we're going to sign it using the intermediate server. So now I've got three levels, right? I've got root, I've got server intermediate, and I've got the server certificate. And the server certificate is what's going to actually be given to Postgres, along with uh, the, the intermediates uh, and the root as necessary. Uh, same thing, but on the client side here, we're going to create the client certificate and a CSR for it. And again, we're going to sign that CSR using the intermediate client certificate authority. Okay, so now we've got all of that boilerplate OpenSSL magic out of the way for anybody who wants to try to set this up on their own. A lot of times, if you're working inside of an enterprise, the enterprise, if they're doing SSL and TLS and certificates, they're going to have all of this all figured out for you already, right? You could just tell your certificate authority for your enterprise, I need a cert for this box, and they'll be like, here's your cert and your key. But this allows you to have a play-by-play -play for how to do it yourself. So how does this all work, right? So SLTSL is based on public key uh, cryptography. Um, certificates are these public documents that are signed by a trusted third party. Each certificate has a key, right? And if you have the key, you can prove that you are who you claim you are, right? Or who the certificate claims you are, right? Again, as mentioned, I have a root CA, intermediate CA, and then a client, or sorry, two intermediate CAs, and then a, a server certificate and a client certificate. All right, now let's talk about setting Postgres up with all this, right? So you need to put the, the certificates and the keys in place. You do need to provide the root CA. So Postgres, the way that this all works, just so for people have an understanding, right, is that the Postgres server needs a certificate to trust, right? That is the root CA, okay? And then it also needs to be able to prove to the client, right, that's connecting that it is a trusted system, and it may need to provide the client with the intermediate CAs to lead all the way back up to the root, okay? The client is the same way, right? The client needs to have the trusted root CA anchor, that's the CA that it trusts, and then it, when it needs to prove 
that the client certificate is valid, it needs to include with the client certificate any intermediate CAs that the server may not be aware of, okay? And so the way that this is done is you copy the, the server certificate into place, you copy the server key into place, of course the server key needs to be, have appropriate permissions on it, and then you need to create this uh, server certificate file, right? So you need to copy the CA certificate, the server key, and then create the certificate file. And that is done by combining the server certificate, right? This is what's going to be sent to the client. Any intermediate CAs that are needed to get from the server certificate up to the trusted root, and then you can include the trusted root as well. It's not strictly necessary, but I usually do anyway so that you have a complete chain. So you combine all of those very simple by catting them together, and then you drop it into place. And then when the client connects, we're going to send them this server CRT file, right? Because that is going to prove to the client who has a copy of the CA independently that our certificate is signed by a CA that they trust. A couple other parameters, right? You just need to set SSL true, set SSL cert file, and uh, set SSL key file, and then SSL CA file. Now, again, the SSL cert file, that's what Postgres will send to the client. The key file is the server's key, and the CA file is the trusted root certificate. All right, and when you're setting this up, if you want to use client-side certificate, you would use host SSL uh, that will only match uh, SSL encrypted connections, and cert is what you would use for saying to Postgres, hey, authentic uh, the authentication method here is client-side certificates. You can also do client-side certificates with Scram as well, if you want, um, and you can specify that by saying Scram and then client cert equals one, there are a couple of uh, new options in 12, um, which are even better. And again, as always, I would say you should be using Verify Vault. Um, these are similar to the SSL mode options. Um, so you really want to use Verify Full to make sure you get uh, full verification um, that the certificate is the correct one that's being presented and not just any. Okay, now on the client side, we also need to do something similar, right? We need the root CA, right? That's who, what the client is gonna trust. We need the client's key, right? And then we need to put the certificates into the cert file. Uh, I say order matters here. This is, this is the case, I think it was TLS 1.1, uh, and then 1.2, I think, is where they allowed uh, it to vary. But uh, yeah, if you're running older systems, make sure you get the ordering correct. Um, it's less of an issue on, on more modern systems. Uh, but again, the, the cert here is what the client is gonna present to the server. You know, it is our certificate plus all intermediate CAs and the root CA to get that full chain all the way back up. Now, when you wanna run the Postgres client, right? Again, you really, 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 really want to be using verify full, right? This is really important, this is really key. This is another way of specifying that SSL mode here. Uh, you can also use an environment variable if you want um, by doing uh, pg SSL mode equals verify full and then you can just use psql-h. Um, again, don't use verify CA <laughs> or you know, really you should be using verify full for, for all of these things. That's what I, I certainly strongly recommend. All right, and that is going to bring me to the end of this discussion, and we have 10 minutes or so for questions. Yes. Where's the question? Ah. Oh, yeah, there's one up here too. Yeah, either way. Thanks for the excellent talk. Uh, my question is focused on the certificates lifecycle. Mm -hmm. One day it ends, and we have to refresh them. Yes. And I said, expect that we have to deploy the new certificates before the old one expires. So mm -hmm. we need all of them to live together. So could it be done online and how it works? Thanks. So, yeah, so um, the way that certificates work is that you're basically, you know, what you're trusting inside of the cert is really the CN. So as long as you uh, create a new certificate with the same CN, right, the same common name, and install it, 
you can just install it kind of anytime and then restart Postgres and it'll pick up on the new cert and, and off you go, right? So there is not a, you, you don't really need the kind of overlap that I think you're talking about when you're talking about certificates. You need that for like scram, right? And that's actually an effort that's underway is allowing support for multiple different uh, passwords to be stored so that you can do password rotation and stuff. But the same doesn't really apply to SSL because as long as you just basically have a new certificate that's got an extended um, uh, uh, you know, expiration date, all we're really looking at is that the certificate presented was signed by RCA and that the common name matches the host that we're trying to connect to. So there's not a, you, you don't need to have multiple certificates be supported concurrently. Um, if you think you still do, please talk to me later. Yes, or did, was there a question back there? Sorry, either way. Hi, uh, among those authentication alternatives, uh, is any option for uh, two-factor authentication? Two-factor authentication. Um, so there is an argument that can be made that Radius uh, will give you two-factor authentication because you can have a PIN and a one-time password with that. Uh, admittedly, you know, that has, there's going to be some debate about that. I, I don't really recommend Radius because that PIN gets sent over and over and over again. But with the one-time password, it's not so bad. So Radius is one approach. The other approach was the one that I was just talking about where you have both a password provided by Scram and a client-side certificate. Um, that is a, a uh, typically um, approved approach for having two-factor authentication as well. Everybody has to have a client-side cert. That client-side cert with Verify Full has to match you, right, that you're log you know, the user that's logging in, and the user has to provide a password as well. So that's the other approach for, for two-factor auth. Um, if you've got other questions about other two-factor auth methods, I'd be happy to talk about it. There's people who are working on things like OAuth and other things for Postgres too, but that's not in Postgres yet. Yes? Yes, uh, one thing is authentication. Another thing is uh, if you, for example, have an, an AD or a free IPA to keep groups uh, mapped to roles in the database. Do you have any, any good advice for... for uh, PG LDAP sync is uh, okay. what I've seen a lot of people people use and, and it I seems to work. It to work, but I should probably just try again. Okay, I mean, if you're having trouble with it, let me know, but I, I have seen it work pretty well. Um, I, that's an area that Postgres could really use someone to spend time on. Um, so just to be clear with people, like LDAP should never be used for authentication, in my opinion. Using it to store groups is perfect. That's what it's for, right? I have no issue with that. And using something like PG LDAP sync or in an ideal future world, Postgres would get support itself or somebody would write an extension to basically just, because you can actually have, you can ha uh, have a client of the LDAP environment, of the Active Directory environment, that just connects and listens for changes. And as soon as a change happens, it gets, it gets pushed down, and then you can, you know, you could have, there's just a matter of, you know, simple matter of programming, right? But somebody has to go do that. But you can have that change uh, be, be fed to you and then, could automatically go create or adjust the users and you know groups and whatever in Postgres for you. Like it, it say it's not even that hard, but it's dealing with LDAP and. Uh, PG LDAP syncs on GitHub. Yeah. Yes. In the first part of your talk, you mentioned that it's very important to check certificate revocation lists. Yes. However, in the second part where you <laughs> did samples, you conveniently omitted it. Do you have any tips on dealing with provocation lists if I would be the person to deal with them? For example, I don't want to use cloud provider managed service or no one else in my organization currently provides like. So OpenSSL does have support for generating CRLs and, and all of that. I, I didn't want to get into, uh, there was enough OpenSSL commands here. <laughs> um, but yes, absolutely, you should uh, look into the OpenSSL documentation and figure out how to use, you know, how to create CRLs with OpenSSL so that you can have a, a, a CRL in place. Um, I, I don't, I, I'm not gonna go into all of how you do that here, <laughs> but it is, it is something that OpenSSL supports. Yes. Two simple questions with hopefully short answers. JDBC clients and cron jobs. Okay, so 
what I think you're talking about it, with regard to, I'll take the second one first, with regard to cron jobs, if the concern is about having Kerberos tickets that are renewed ongoing, K5 Start is your friend, right? K5 Start is the tool to use. Uh, you can provide it with a key tab file and it will just constantly renew uh, the tickets um, provided the, the KDC allows it to, right? But as long as that is still a valid principle, it'll keep renewing it forever and it works great. So no issue with that. JDBC also supports Kerberos um, and DSS API authentication. Um, not sure what else you had about JDBC, but it does support Kerberos. Okay, yes? Right. Time for one or two more questions. Yeah, I got one up here. I thought about including JDBC, but I had enough stuff in this talk already. Yes? To go back to the, uh, to LDAP again. To the, uh, uh, to, to, to LDAP, LDAP. yeah. Um, <laughs> I guess what you're saying is that LDAP should never uh, authenticate users, but you can use it to authorize access? Yes, that would be, that would be correct. You can use it to gain the information for auth authorization, right, yeah. such as group membership and things, but you should not be using LDAP as the auth method inside of Postgres, because if you do that, the user's password gets sent in the clear to the Postgres server, which is bad. Yes, down here in front. So when you're using a Kerberos to a, a Windows server, uh, would you then use the LDAP to talk to the Windows AD to get the groups mapping? So yeah, you need to, yeah, you like so a, you need you, it to have both then, because other support. Hang on, so I log the, in, I authenticate with, with the AD, and then I need, I have some roles that I want to put those authenticated into automatically. So they get their privileges through roles. Right. So and that would be a role of. But the membership. first authentication doesn't use LDAP, right? Oh. The first authentication uses SSPI if you're on a Windows system yeah. or you know, Kerberos essentially, right? And then, yes, you would still need to have something like PG LDAP sync or have some way of pulling the group membership out of LDAP and creating those groups inside of the Postgres server. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, we could do one more or we can call and go get some coffee. Any other questions? I like coffee. Steven, thank you so much. All right, thank you everyone.